Hi, this is Tom Lombardo, Director of the Center for Future Consciousness and the Wisdom Page. And all three parts of this video presentation can be found on my website, centerforfutureconsciousness.com, along with references and a text of the entire narration. This is Contemporary Trends and Theories and Paradigms of the Future, Part 1. This three-part presentation is based on two chapters in my book, Contemporary Futurist Thought, Modern Times and the Contemporary Transformation and Theories and Paradigms of the Future. Trends and Developments, the 20th Century, 1900 to the 1960s. On this slide are images, icons, significant individuals of the period 1900 to the 1960s including Marilyn Monroe and Roosevelt and Einstein and Mao and Lenin and Hitler and the civil rights movement and the trenches of World War I and Casablanca and Rosie the Riveter, We Can Do It and the hippie culture and Elvis Presley and Picasso and the Empire State Building and the emergence of jazz. Generally, the 20th century begins in a state of optimism, in a belief in great technological progress ahead. In fact, Peter Watson in The Modern Mind states that the 20th century turned out to be the most eventful century within human history. We see the emergence of science fiction and future studies as ways to understand and approach the future. We see the emergence of utopias and dystopias that were written about the future. We see both a greater sense of the future and a greater and a deeper sense of the past as revealed through archaeology and paleontology and astronomy. That is, we see an expanding temporal consciousness in the 20th century. Watson describes the early 20th century as disturbing the peace, involving innovation and science and in art and literature and music challenging the status quo, moving away from the past into a new future, challenging traditional ways of thinking, as in Einstein, Picasso, and Stravinsky. Well, we see two great world wars in the Great Economic Depression during the period 1914 to 1945. We see violence in the name of the future. We see potential self-extinction looming ahead of us with the development of the A-bomb. We see, in fact, the loss of faith in progress, at least technological or scientific progress or progress in human nature. And we see the emergence of a Cold War. Throughout much of the early 20th century, we see an ongoing conflict between democracy, freedom, and individual rights versus collectivism, authoritarianism, and communism. We see the ongoing struggle and advances in the rights of women. We see the growth of pop culture involving movies, music, records, media, radio, TV, advertising, consumer goods, and the popularization of the American dream. But we see ongoing critiques of this consumerist, materialistic, hedonistic, capitalist culture, for example, through the writings of the Beats and the actions of the hippies. We see a distrust in authority and institutions growing. But we see the continued spread of modernization across the globe. In the 1940s and 50s, we also see the emergence of existentialism and postmodernism as critiques of contemporary times where there is a loss of faith in the West, in the Western notion of progress, in rationalism, and in absolute truth. We see the emergence of extreme individualism and subjectivism and relativism, but we see counter critiques defending Western ideals, and we see the emergence of a new grand narrative in evolution as explaining the entire panorama of history and nature. Indeed, the early part of the 20th century is a maze of contradictions. Basic trends and developments that we can derive from this period, which I base upon Peter Watson's The Modern Mind, David Christian's Maps of Time, and Edward Cornish's Futuring, among other books, include accelerative change across multiple dimensions of reality, accelerative growth in population, accelerative productivity, accelerative consumption and use of energy, but also accelerative growth of waste, accelerative growth of wealth, 
the emergence of mass agriculture, increasing literacy and learning in populations across the globe, the spread and evolution of industry and technology, the continued growth of transnational corporations, increasing health and longevity, accelerative innovation, the spread of democracy, human rights, decolonization, and independence of previously controlled countries and colonies that were under the dominance of Europe, the ongoing transformation of the environment, and increasing globalization in communication, culture, and trade. Now if we come to the contemporary global transformation, that's taking place during the last 50 years, first off, we see a continuation of all of those earlier 20th century or modern trends. And here on this screen, we see a new set of imagery and icons and significant individuals. We see the skyline of Hong Kong. We see poverty and robots and the earth burning up due to global warming. We see pollution and congestion. We see man being lost in the TV screen and being lost within virtual reality. We see terrorism and we see war and we see violence jumping out of us out of the TV screen and we see the spread of the cell phone and mass communication. Indeed, the 20th century global transformation can be seen as a very ambiguous era Something is happening here, what it is ain't exactly clear. Buffalo Springfield, as expressed through Charles Dickens in his book A Tale of Two Cities, written in 1859, we can describe the contemporary global transformation as the best of times, the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness, the epoch of belief, the epoch of incredulity, a season of light, a season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair, that we have everything before us, that we have nothing before us. They were all going direct to heaven, they were all going direct the other way. Indeed, as Ramaz Nas states, we live in a period of unprecedented prosperity, unprecedented opportunity, and unprecedented risk. The contemporary globalization, uh, the contemporary global transformation, basic themes and issues. Our period is a crossover period with no unifying narrative or theme. In fact, the competing narratives and worldviews, as discussed in Walter Truett Anderson's book, Reality Isn't What It Used to Be, as well as in Peter Watson's book, The Modern Mind. We see for almost everybody an acknowledgement of the reality of accelerative change, for example, as described in Alvin Toffler's Future Shock, but we see multiple views and reactions to accelerative change. That is, is it positive or is it negative? For example, as discussed in the limits of growth, the limits to growth. That is, is accelerative change something we should embrace or something we should resist? We see that we perhaps are at a point of crisis and catastrophe, as well as transcendence. That is, there are both anticipations of great disaster and mind-boggling evolution. Perhaps crisis is good, as discussed in Conscious Evolution by Barbara Marks Hubbard. We see multiple ways of transformation going on, from the scientific technological to the ecological environmental to the social psychological and religious. We see multiple and different attempts to identify the big trends across all these dimensions of reality, such as discussed in Nesbitt's books, as well as in The Limits to Growth, as well as in Walter Moss's An Age of Progress with a Question Mark, as well as discussed by Barbara Marx Hubbard and Cornish and Anderson. As one fundamental conflict theme or trend that we see of the last 50 years, we see continued ongoing globalization, the movement toward unity versus localism and the movement toward pluralism. A second fundamental theme that we see being discussed and debated is optimism versus pessimism about the future. That is, should we be optimistic or pessimistic? As discussed in Dinesh D'Souza's The Virtue of Prosperity and in uh, Richard Slaughter's The Biggest Wake-Up Call in History. We see efforts being made to pull it all together to integrate 
and provide holistic interpretations of what is going on within human reality, such as in Sally Gurner's the uh, After the Clockwork Universe. And we see the emergence of the annual State of the Future reports, which are ongoing collective efforts to identify the fundamental challenges and trends in the world today, to monitor them, and to guide the development toward more progressive and positive resolutions of them at a global level. That is, we see a progress report emerging relative to the key challenges we face today. And finally, we see post-postmodernism, which are attempts to go beyond relativism and postmodernism. As a good example to look at to get a sense of the global transformation and the ambiguity of it, there was a symposium that was organized by William Hallow and Michael Marion in Journal of Future Studies in December of 2011, which debated the global mega crisis. And the term global mega crisis is used to refer to the set of interconnected global problems that many people think are at a crisis point, that are a threat involving the potential collapse of modern human civilization. The people who participated in this symposium voted on whether they were more favorably, favorably disposed toward believing in Hallow's techno-facilitated evolutionary optimistic vision of the future and 40 percent of the uh, participants supported that view versus Michael Marion's info glut ignorance indecision and inadequacy or pessimistic view of the future of which 60 percent voted more in favor of that and if we look at the reasons that participants gave for their voting we find a variability in their theoretical frameworks in their cultural mindsets in the selection interpretation of facts that they use to support their view and an overall difference in disposition toward life and the future at both a personal and an emotional level thus influencing whether or not they came out thinking that they were more optimistic versus more pessimistic about the future, the ambiguity of our times. If we turn now to trends, predictions, possibilities, and theories of the future, what indeed are the key trends for different dimensions of human reality? We've already introduced a number of them regarding the global transformation. What are the key predictions that are based on these trends? What are the influential theories for these different dimensions and trends? And what are the possibilities, probable, plausible, preferable, and way out wild card possibilities? There, in fact, are multiple theories of the future that interpret and explain both the past and the present and pers prescribe and predict the future. These are theoretical and selective interpretations of the nature of facts and values. We find multiple paradigms regarding the future, which are theories plus ways of life, that is ideas coupled together with actions or modes of action that are structured by those ideas. We find multiple social movements across the globe, that is collective paradigms involving an active agenda to change and influence human reality in the future. We find multiple worldviews, that is, general theories of reality that have implications regarding the future. And we find multiple grand narratives for the future, that is, worldviews in the form of a story, where stories, in fact, are the preferred modes of human understanding regarding past, present, and future that give interpretive meaning, explanation, and direction for the people who believe in them. In fact, what we find is that Everyone is a futurist in contemporary times. It is everyone has a worldview, a grand narrative, a sense of the future. Everyone anticipates and predicts and has goals and plans and values that are part of their normal psychological consciousness and functioning. And everyone possesses a theoretically informed future consciousness. Now, if we turn to theories of evolution, change, and time, that discuss stability, presentism, progress, decay, oblivion, transcendence, and the yearning for the good old days, we find a variety of different general theories of 
how we should come at and look at both the past, the present, and the future. And I will, first of all, identify some of them before getting into the specific dimensions of human existence that are covered in uh, later slides. These theories provide big pictures of time, of how human history in the future fits within big pictures of of time within the universe. One theory is that evolution provides a big picture of time and that human history is part of evolution, which we find in Frazier, Prigogine, and Morowitz, and Stewart. And this provides a basis for them making predictions about the future. We come to the question within the, uh, this general arena of has there been progress or not regarding past, present, and anticipating into the future. And Moore and Simon will answer that indeed there has been progress. But we have other people who will question what is the meaning of progress, such as Richard Slaughter. We have the whole issue of things moving faster and things evolving faster, and whether this is good or bad, as discussed in Gleick. Kurzweil and Strauss. We have the question of are we perhaps heading toward decline, decay, extinction, and oblivion as discussed in Martin Rees' Our Final Hour. We have books that deal with human perspectives on time, of past, present, and future. Are we developing a greater sense of time, or is our sense of time shrinking toward the present, as discussed in Frazier and Roshkoff? And should we preserve stability and try to keep things the same, or should we embrace change, as discussed in Paul Ray's book, The Culture of Creatives, and Virginia Postrel's The Future and Its Enemies? Now, at this point, we are going to move to the, a more analytical approach and look at specific dimensions of human existence. And for each of these dimensions, I will highlight only some trends, possibilities, and theories, but a complete list of all the books and the authors and all the trends and developments covered in all of these slides is included in the printed text of the narration. And I will begin with science and the growth of knowledge. Once our eyes are turned from the horrors of the past decades, the dominant intellectual trend, the most interesting, enduring, and profound development is very clear. Our century has been dominated intellectually by a coming to terms with science. Science has changed how we think. Peter Watson. Trends. What we have seen in the last hundred years is an ongoing and continued second scientific revolution begun with the theory of relativity and quantum physics and into more present times with string theory and evolutionary open systems theory. And all of this is producing a ongoing transformation in our mindset regarding reality and the cosmos. We have seen an accelerated expansion of knowledge and information and a broadening and deepening understanding of nature and the cosmos. We have seen increasing application of scientific knowledge to all spheres of human life, empowering humanity. But on the negative side, we have seen the growth of scientism, which is pushing out other modes of knowing, thinking, and experience, and other values, where science has become too much of a god, they have too much faith in science as a way of thinking about reality as a whole. And there have been ongoing critiques of science and rationalism as limiting human experience. And we have also seen an increasing level of uncertainty because as more answers come forth, so do more questions. And in fact, science and knowledge through specialization is fragmenting. And in fact, due to the growth of knowledge and information, we are overloading the human mind. And we have a loss of big picture understanding, a loss of wisdom and enlightenment. If we look at theories regarding science and the growth of knowledge, we see that there are multiple efforts that have been developed to provide an integrative and comprehensive scientific understanding of the universe, as articulated by Stephen Hawking and by Brian Greene and by Lee Smolin. We have the prediction that in 
the coming near future, for example, say through string theory, we'll be able to provide a complete understanding of everything, such as articulated in Hawkins' books as well as in Keiko. We have optimistic futurist visions of the spread and application of science, such as in Keiko's books. We have broad evolutionary visions developed within science that extend into the far distant future, providing a general framework for predicting the future out a Google years in time, such as provided by Adams and Lachlan in their book, The Five Ages of the Universe. We have the emerging application of information and computer theory to science and reality, including human reality, such as in Lloyd and Deutsch. We, though, have doubts about our contemporary scientific understanding of nature being expressed, that something very big is still not understood, such as as expressed in Smolin and Nagel. And toward the future, we can ask, will we ever have a complete understanding of nature through science or not? Will science come to an end, as Horgan suggests? Or are there still plenty of questions and puzzles that need to be answered that extend outward in time as far as we can possibly imagine, as discussed in Science at the Edge by John Brockman? And that brings us to the end of part one.